My name is Jason, and I am a chef by passion and profession. A head chef, actually. If I don't go to work, one of the most popular fine dine spots of LA falls into chaos. I've been working hard lately and usually have to pull off later hours, something which has been causing a bit of a rift between me and my girl. So Valentine's Day was supposed to be the one where I had to make some sacrifices on the work front. I had to make it a day where my culinary skills would intertwine with the romance I shared with Valentina. She had gone hiking with her best friend, Matt, and was due to return by 7pm for the special dinner I had planned. But as the evening unfolded, it became anything but romantic. Firstly, I didn't want her to go. I mean, who abandons their boyfriend on Valentine's Day to take a hike with their best friend? I could very much understand that she was trying to teach me a lesson, and I knew that if I had to save the night, I should keep my mouth shut. I had to spend the day in a flurry of activities, crafting a menu that was a labor of love. Seared scallops, her favorite steak done to perfection, and a delicious chocolate mousse for dessert. Everything was laid out meticulously, the table set with candles and roses, creating an ambiance befitting the occasion. As the clock ticked past the agreed time, I sent Valentina a text, my anticipation tinged with a hint of worry. Hey love, dinner's ready, everything okay? Sorry, running a bit late, the hike's taking longer than expected. I tried to remain patient, busying myself with last-minute touches to the dishes, but as the minutes turned into hours, her texts started veering into the realm of the bizarre. You've been gone a while. Should I start worrying? Got distracted. Found something weird in the woods. I'll tell you about it when I get there. Her vague responses did little to quell my growing unease. To add to my frustrations, I noticed a rat dart across the kitchen. We'd had a minor infestation problem lately, but this was the worst possible timing. I couldn't let a rat win as well now. Grabbing a bat, I gave chase, my mood souring further. The rat proved elusive, evading my every attempt to hit it, ultimately vanishing into the hole in the wall. Defeated and angered, I tossed the bat aside, my mind now a whirlwind of concerns. Valentina's delayed return, her odd messages, and now this infuriating rat problem. It felt like the universe was conspiring to ruin our night. Val, it's getting really late. When are you coming home? Lost track of time. Heading back now. Sorry, babe. I wanted to believe her, but a nagging suspicion crept into my thoughts. Was there something going on between her and Matt? The thought was like a splinter in my mind, refusing to be ignored. By the time the clock struck 11, my worry had morphed into a blend of anger and anxiety. Then, finally, the door opened. Valentina stepped in, but she was different. Her usually vibrant demeanor was replaced by an unsettlingly subdued aura. Her eyes lacked their usual spark, and her movements were strangely lethargic. As I greeted her, ready to express my frustration, she cut me off, insisting repeatedly that she was already full and didn't want any of the dinner I'd prepared. This was unlike her. She always relished my cooking. You're not hungry, but you love my steak, and I've been preparing all day. I just don't feel like eating right now, Jason. I had something on the hike. Her words were off, her tone distant. It was as if she was avoiding something, hiding a secret that lay just beyond my reach. The apartment, usually warm and inviting, now felt cold, as if a chill had followed her inside. As the night progressed, the atmosphere in the apartment shifted. There was a tangible sense of unease. I couldn't point, but I thought objects seemed to move on their own. Lights flickered without reason, and a chilling cold enveloped the space even though the radiator was working. Valentina's behavior became increasingly bizarre as well. She mumbled things in between in a language I couldn't recognize, her voice taking on an eerie timbre. Maybe I was just finding reasons. I left one of the busiest days at my restaurant to be with her, but she was disinterested, like I've never seen her before. The evening had turned from a romantic celebration into a surreal, unnerving experience. I found myself questioning not just our relationship, but my very perception of reality. What had happened on that hike? What had she found in the woods? And most importantly, what was wrong with her? 
The Valentina that stood before me now was a far cry from the woman I knew and loved. She appeared a bit strange. The clock struck midnight, yet the eerie aura that enveloped the apartment showed no signs of waning. Standing there with the Valentine's dinner I had painstakingly prepared lying untouched, I felt a mixture of resentment and profound concern. Valentina's behavior was increasingly perplexing. Her aversion to the food, uh, her distant demeanor, and her comments about being full was unsettling to say the least. She had been following intermittent fasting religiously before we even started dating. I knew that the woman would do anything to stick to her diet, so I knew that she was lying. Val, this isn't like you. You've been acting off ever since you got back. What happened on that hike? I just don't feel like eating right now, Jason. I had something on the hike. Her dismissive tone irked me. The more I pressed for clarity, the more she retreated into the shell of ambiguity. My mind raced with possibilities, the most unsettling of which was the thought of her and Matt. But as the night progressed, the nature of my concern shifted dramatically. Valentina's behavior became increasingly bizarre. She paced the apartment restlessly, her movements erratic and uncoordinated. At one point, she stopped abruptly, staring blankly at the wall as if seeing something invisible to my eyes. Valentina, w- what are you looking at? Can't you hear them, Jason? The whispers. There were no whispers, just the deafening silence of the apartment punctuated by the occasional flicker of the lights. A chill crept down my spine the room inexplicably growing colder. My breath became visible, fogging in the frigid air. I wrapped my arms around myself, struggling to make sense of the rapidly deteriorating situation. As the night deepened, the apartment seemed to take on a life of its own. Doors slammed shut without any draft, lights dimmed and brightened of their own accord, and shadows moved in the periphery of my vision, playing tricks on my mind. Valentina's strange behavior escalated in tandem with the paranormal activities. She began mumbling in a language I couldn't understand, her voice distorted, almost manly at times. Panic began to set in. The woman I loved was transforming into something unrecognizable, something frightening. I tried to approach her, to reach out and understand what was happening, but she recoiled from my touch, her skin icy cold. Val, please talk to me. What's going on with you? It's so cold, Jason. So very cold. Her words sent shivers through me. The temperature of the apartment had dropped further, a supernatural chill that seemed to emanate from her very being. In a moment of horrifying clarity, I realized that whatever was happening to Valentina was beyond the realm of the natural, beyond anything I could comprehend. Something happened on that hike. I gave call to Matt to ask what was up, but he was unavailable. The apartment suddenly became a theater of the macabre, with Valentina as the unwilling protagonist. With my own eyes, I saw objects levitating momentarily before crashing to the ground, mirrors fogging over as if breathed upon by unseen entities, and the shadows seemed to dance with a life of their own. Valentina's demeanor oscillated between moments of lucidity and terrifying episodes where she seemed entirely possessed by an unknown force. As I stood there, torn between fleeing and staying to help the woman I loved, a dreadful thought crossed my mind. Was Valentina under the influence of something supernatural? The notion seemed ludicrous, yet the events of the night defied any logical explanation. In a desperate bid to restore some normalcy, I attempted to engage her in conversation, to pull her back. Val, we need to get you help. This isn't right. (laughs) Help? It's too late for help, Jason. Her laughter was chilling, void of any warmth or humanity. It echoed through the apartment, a sinister sound that seemed to mock my helplessness. I was out of my depth, facing a situation that was rapidly spiraling into a nightmare. The woman I had planned to spend a romantic evening with was now at the center of a terrifying mystery, one that threatened to engulf us both in its dark embrace. The night had transformed into a surreal horror, far removed from the romantic evening I had envisioned. Valentina, the woman I had known and loved, was now a stranger her behavior increasingly erratic and terrifying. 
The apartment, once a sanctuary, had become a stage for inexplicable and chilling phenomena. Valentina's transformation was the most disturbing of all. Her moments of lucidity were fleeting, quickly giving way to episodes where she seemed entirely consumed by an unknown force. She kept speaking in a language that was alien to my ears, her voice taking on a sinister, otherworldly quality. Val, what's happening to you? This isn't normal. We need to find help. Help? There's no help for what's inside me. Her response sent a wave of terror through me. It was becoming increasingly clear that we were dealing with something beyond the natural realm. The apartment itself seemed to react to her presence. I realized that the closer I went to her, the chillier it got. She was the reason for the cold. In one particularly horrifying moment, Valentina's body contorted in ways that defied human physiology, her movements jerky and unnatural. Her eyes, once warm and loving, now bore into mine with an intensity that was almost predatory. As the night progressed, the supernatural occurrences escalated. The very walls of the apartment seemed to pulsate with an unseen energy, amplifying the sense of dread that permeated the air. The boundary between reality and nightmare blurred, leaving me questioning my sanity. I panicked and called her friend again, but still got no response. In a moment of desperation, I reached out to Valentina, hoping to connect with whatever part of her remained. Valentina, please, if you can hear me, fight this. I don't know what's happening, but I'm here for you. Too late. Too late. Her words trailed off into an eerie whisper, her gaze fixated on something beyond my sight. The atmosphere in the apartment turned even more sinister, as if her words had invoked an unseen presence. Then a terrifying vision seized me. I found myself in a mountainous terrain, tied to a tree, getting spat on by men in black masks who took turns to come ahead and cut me with a knife. They were chanting in some strange language, the same that I had heard Valentina say, and walking around in circles. As I yelled in pain, lost blood, and grew unconscious, I saw eagles floating up, waiting for my pain to be over to finally consume me. I snapped back to reality and looked at Valentina, her form now barely recognizable as the woman I loved. The sinister entity that had taken hold of her seemed to be growing in strength, feeding off her energy and the fear that filled the apartment. The vision. Was it the entity's way of letting me know what had happened to it? The night had descended into a waking nightmare, a battle against a supernatural force that defied explanation. Valentina, caught in the grip of this malevolent spirit, was both the victim and the conduit for the terror that unfolded around us. The turmoil in the apartment reached its zenith, the air charged with an almost tangible malevolence. Valentina's behavior was now entirely crazy, her actions dictated by the sinister force that had overtaken her. Our relationship, once defined by love and understanding, had developed into a nightmarish struggle for survival. In a desperate attempt to reach her, to break through the darkness that enveloped her, I initiated a confrontation. Valentina, this isn't you! Whatever has taken a hold of you, you need to fight it! Fight it? Oh, Jason, but I have already won. Her response chilled me to the bone. It was clear that the entity speaking through her was mocking my efforts, reveling in the chaos it had wrought. As we argued, the supernatural phenomena around us intensified. Objects flew across the room with violent force, narrowly missing us. The flickering lights cast grotesque shadows that seemed to dance mockingly on the walls. In the midst of our heated exchange, strange wounds started popping up on her body. They were intricate and seemed to pulsate with a dark energy. Val, what are those symbols? <laughs> Aren't they beautiful? Each one a reminder of how they stabbed me. The revelation sent a wave of horror through me. The situation had escalated beyond a mere possession. It was as if Valentina had become a vessel for something ancient and malevolent. The climax of our confrontation came when Valentina, in a fit of rage, hurled her dinner plate across the room. It shattered against the wall, its fragments scattering like the pieces of our once normal life. 
And that is when the rat emerged from behind the crack in the wall. In a horrifying display of her new unnatural nature, she lunged at a rat scurrying across the floor, catching it with terrifying speed and biting its head off with a gruesome crunch. Val, what are you doing? This isn't you! Oh, but it is, Jason. This is the real me now. The grotesque act was a stark, gut-wrenching confirmation of the sinister transformation she had undergone. The Valentina I knew and loved was gone, replaced by this monstrous entity that wore her face. In that moment of shocking violence, I realized the full extent of the horror we were engulfed in. The supernatural force that had claimed Valentina was not just controlling her, it had meddled with her very being, warping her into something unrecognizable. As the entity inside her continued to manifest its power, I understood that I was not just fighting to save Valentina, I was fighting against an ancient evil presence that threatened to consume everything. The terror of the night reached its harrowing climax as I stood, paralyzed with fear and disbelief, in our once peaceful apartment. Valentina, or the entity that she had become, stared at me with eyes that were a horrifying mix of the familiar and the utterly alien. The darkness within her seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. In a moment of terrifying clarity, the entity possessing Valentina began to speak, its voice a chilling blend of her own and something ancient and malevolent. You still don't understand, do you, Jason? The power I possess, the ancient lineage I now continue. I listened, horror-struck as the entity revealed its true nature. It spoke of an ancient ritualistic sacrifice, a malevolent spirit bound to the earth, seeking a vessel to inhabit and continue its dark legacy. The entity had been dormant, waiting for the right host, and it found that in Valentina during her hike with Matt. Where's Matt? What happened to him? Why do you think I wasn't hungry? The realization hit me like a physical blow. The entity had consumed Matt, explaining Valentina's lack of hunger and the strange fullness she had claimed to feel. But now it hungered again, and its gaze upon me was predatory, filled with a sinister intent. What have you done with Valentina? Where is she? Valentina is here with me, part of me now. A sickening sense of dread washed over me as the entity moved towards me with an unnatural grace. Its intentions were clear. I was to be its next victim. I backed away, my mind racing for a way to escape this nightmare. But the entity was relentless. It cornered me, its strength overwhelming. In a desperate bid for survival, I grabbed the nearest object, my chef's knife. The chase through the apartment was a blur, a terrifying game of cat and mouse with me as the prey. The entity wearing Valentina's face lunged at me, its eyes filled with malevolent glee. I acted on instinct, the knife in my hand finding its mark. The entity let out a blood-curdling scream as it collapsed, the malevolent light in its eyes flickering out. I stood there, shaking, the knife dripping with blood. The weight of what I had done was crushing. I had just killed Valentina, the woman I loved, even though it wasn't really her anymore. Tears streaming down my face, I called 911, my voice breaking as I tried to explain the unexplainable. Please, you have to help me. I, I had to do it. She, it wasn't her anymore. When the police arrived, they found me a broken man, slumped on the kitchen floor. But to my utter shock and horror, Valentina's body was gone. No trace of the entity. No blood. Nothing. It was as if the night's events had been a figment of my imagination. The officers left, casting dubious glances my way, their suspicion evident. Alone, I tried to piece together the shattered remnants of my sanity. How could she just disappear? Was the entity still out there? As I struggled to comprehend the night's events, a small, chilling detail caught my eye. A rat, its head missing, meandering across the kitchen floor. It was an eerie echo of the night's horror, a reminder that what had transpired was all too real. The reality of the situation dawned on me. The entity, 
Though wounded was still at large, its malevolent presence a lurking shadow in my life, I was left to grapple with the guilt, the fear, and the unanswerable questions that now filled my world. In the aftermath of that Valentine's night, my existence became a haunting graveyard, a life overshadowed by the darkness of an ancient, unfathomable evil. I'm Kelly, and if someone had told me a year ago that my life would take such a bizarre and terrifying turn, I would have laughed it off. But here I am, struggling to piece together the events that unfolded at an old Catholic school in the heart of Kentucky, where I started my career as a kindergarten teacher. The school, a grand old building with Gothic arches and stone walls, had stood the test of time, witnessing centuries of history. I remember the mix of excitement and nervousness I felt on my first day. It felt like Hogwarts. But as I walked through its dark halls, unaware of the dark secrets it harbored, I felt a sense of unease. My arrival at the school came after a series of personal struggles. I had recently lost my beloved uncle under strange circumstances. He was a paranormal investigator, passionate about uncovering the truth behind unexplained phenomena. His death occurred during an investigation at a reputedly haunted mansion. He had brought home a strange doll one night. He didn't greet anyone, but just took it to his room. The next morning, he didn't open his doors. The official report stated a heart attack, but I knew that something stranger was at play since the doll had simply disappeared. His untimely demise left me with a lingering curiosity about the supernatural a quest for understanding that I never fully acknowledged until I arrived at the school. It didn't take long for the odd occurrences to begin. The first was a sighting of a woman in a black veil standing silently in the graveyard behind the school. I would see her from my classroom window, a solitary figure among the weathered tombstones who looked like she had a face of a raven. Each time I tried to get a closer look, she would disappear, as if she were just a figment of my imagination. The school staff, when approached, dismissed my inquiries with an air of disdain, as if I were overstepping an unspoken boundary. They would offer vague explanations or change the subject, but I knew that they were hiding something. But the children, in their innocence, told me things. They spoke of ghostly figures that roamed the school, figures that were not real. When I asked how they knew, they said, they don't appear in mirrors. This revelation sent chills down my spine, stirring memories of my uncle's tales of spirits and apparitions. One particularly foggy afternoon, as the school was cloaked in a cloudy mist, I saw her again, the woman in the black veil, This time, she was closer to the school building and I could see that she wore a mask, dark and sinister, shaped like a raven's head. Its eyes hollow and unseeing, evoking a sense of dread that I couldn't shake off. That night, I lay awake, the image of the raven mask etched in my mind. I felt an unexplainable connection to these apparitions, a pull towards the unknown that both scared and intrigued me. I remembered my uncle's voice. Something was urging me to delve deeper, to uncover the truth behind these spectral sightings. The next day, I began to probe into the school's history. It was clear that there was something more to this old building and its inhabitants than met the eye. The occurrences only intensified, evolving from mere sightings to more tangible, unsettling events. One morning, as I walked down the silent hallways, I heard a soft whispering. It seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I paused, straining to listen, and the whispering stopped abruptly, as if aware of my attention. In classrooms, objects began to move on their own. Books would fall off shelves without reason, and windows would open and close, as if manipulated by unseen hands. That night, while wandering the dimly lit corridors after school hours, I stumbled upon something interesting. 
Mrs. Nunes, an English teacher who had been at the school for over 30 years, was huddled in a secluded corner, a lit cigarette between her fingers. Smoking was strictly prohibited on school grounds, a rule that, if broken, could easily lead to dismissal. Seizing the opportunity, I approached Mrs. Nunes. Her eyes widened in shock and fear as I caught her in the act. I knew I had leverage now, and I used it. In a hushed tone, I demanded to know more about the veiled woman and the strange occurrences around the school. Reluctantly, and with a hint of fear in her eyes, Mrs. Nunes began to reveal the school's grim history. The school, she explained in a trembling voice, was built on ancient native indigenous graveyard. This revelation sent a shiver down my spine. She spoke of the land's history, tainted with violence and massacres. In the 18th century, this area was a battleground between many different Native American tribes, steeped in bloodshed and sorrow. There were ancient practices, spells, and a form of dark magic that the tribe supposedly practiced to grant passage to their dead. And then the settlers came and built this church here while driving away all the tribes, if not killing them. As she spoke, the air around us seemed to grow colder, the shadows deeper. This mask, she explained, was no ordinary artifact. It was a symbol of great power and fear among the tribes. Wearing the mask during rituals was believed to grant the wearer the ability to communicate with spirits, to seek their guidance or appease their anger. But it was also a harbinger of doom, a sign that the veil between the living and the dead had been breached. The more Mrs. Nunes revealed, the more the pieces began to fall into place. The woman in the black veil, the unexplained noises, the fleeting shadows, they were all connected to the school's tragic past, echoes of a time steeped in blood and mysticism. That night, as I lay in bed, my mind raced with information I had gathered. The school's foundation on an ancient graveyard, the history of violence, the rituals involving the black raven mask, it all painted a picture of a place haunted not just by ghosts, but by a legacy of pain and suffering. Determined to uncover the full extent of this legacy, I decided to visit the school library the next day to scour old records and delve into the history that Mrs. Nunes had hinted at. There was a restricted section that was only accessible to the sisters of the church. The notion that the school was built on an ancient native indigenous graveyard was not just unsettling, but also ignited a thirst for knowledge about the land's dark history. And I wanted to know more about it. What I didn't know was that this decision would lead me to a chilling discovery, one that would change everything I thought I knew about the school. The school, with its Gothic architecture and stone walls, was not just a place of learning. It was a monument built upon a foundation of ancient pain and suffering. The library was a treasure trove of old records and forgotten lore. Dusty books and aged manuscripts filled its shelves, each holding secrets waiting to be discovered. As I scoured through the records, my eyes fell upon old newspaper clippings and diaries that spoke of the land's history. There were accounts of the battles fought, the lives lost, and the rituals performed. One particular diary caught my attention. It belonged to a teacher who had worked at the school in the early 1900s. Her entries were filled with observations and anecdotes about the school, but as the days progressed, her writings took on a more ominous tone. She wrote of strange occurrences, unexplained incidents that mirrored what I was experiencing. Her final entries were frantic, filled with fear, as she described seeing figures in black veils and hearing whispers in the dead of night. The more I read, the more I realized that the school's history was steeped in supernatural occurrences, a cycle of hauntings and unexplained events that had persisted for centuries. The connection to the Black Raven mask, a symbol so deeply entwined with the land's history, was undeniable. That night, as I left the library, the halls of the school seemed more foreboding than ever. 
The shadows appeared to stretch and twist in unnatural ways, and the silence was heavy with secrets yet to be uncovered. I knew then that my journey into the school's past was far from over. There were more secrets to unearth, more connections to make, and I was determined to bring them all to light. In the following days, the school transformed in my eyes. It was no longer just an old building with a storied past. It had become a nexus of unexplained phenomena and spectral mysteries. The children's tales of people who aren't real and the history Mrs. Nunes revealed about the land on which the school stood set the stage for a deepening of the hauntings. Driven by a mix of fear and determination, I decided to investigate further. I dove into the old records of the school library again and wondered if they might hold more clues. As I sifted through dusty notebooks and ancient registers, a faint, cold breeze brushed past me despite the closed windows. I felt a presence, almost as if a spirit was guiding me. My hand stopped on a particularly old ledger. It was a record of the school's staff, dating back decades. What I found in those yellow pages was chilling. There was a log of the names of the teachers dating back to the 1940s. Along their names were their addresses, ages, marital statuses, and some more information. But then I noticed that every few years, there were some female teachers with the symbol X marked against their names. It was exactly what it looked like. There was a pattern of teachers disappearing from the school, their tenure ending abruptly with no explanation. These disappearances stretched back as far as the ledger did. They were all in their 20s, unmarried, came from different towns and cities, and were living alone. As I delved deeper, a reference caught my eye, a mention of a black raven mask. It was a brief note in the margin of a page, but it stood out starkly. The note was linked to one of the teacher's disappearances, suggesting a connection I could not ignore. The more I uncovered, the more the pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. The school's troubled past, the indigenous graveyard it was built upon, the ghostly figures, the unexplained disappearances, and now the black raven mask. They were all connected in a tapestry of mystery and darkness. I played the day's discoveries in my mind as I cooked my dinner that night. The whispers in the hallways, the guiding spirit in the library, the haunting pattern of missing teachers. It was as if the school itself was trying to communicate with me to reveal its secrets. But with every answer came more questions. What was the significance of the black raven mask? How was it connected to the disappearances of the teachers? And most importantly, what did it all mean for me? The following day, I returned to the library, determined to find more answers. The air felt heavier this time, charged with an energy that was both terrifying and exhilarating. I somehow had a gut feeling that I was on the brink of a discovery, one that would uncover the truth behind the hauntings and perhaps bring peace to the restless spirits that roamed the school. And that's when I saw it again, a woman in a black veil standing in the library, wearing a raven mask and still as air. I stood paralyzed, chills down my spine, heart raging through my chest. But then I realized it wasn't harming me. It was just looking at me. I opened my mouth to say something and as if it sensed, it moved suddenly. It floated in the air and slowly started heading towards the library door. My journey into the heart of the school's mystery took a dramatic turn. I decided to follow the veiled raven mask woman. This time, I wasn't as scared more determined to uncover her identity and her connection to the school's haunted past. As I watched her from a distance, the veiled figure moved with an ethereal grace, drifting towards the old church that stood adjacent to the school. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed, careful to keep out of sight. The church was seldom used, its old pews gathering dust, a relic of a bygone area. The woman in the black veil entered the church, her figure swallowed by the shadows within. 
I hesitated at the threshold, every instinct screaming at me to turn back, but I couldn't. I needed answers. Inside, the church was shrouded in darkness, the only light filtering through the stained glass windows, casting colorful yet eerie patterns on the stone floor. I followed the woman down the central aisle, my footsteps echoing in the silent space. Then she vanished before my eyes as if melting into the shadows. In her place, I noticed a section of the floor that seemed different from the rest. It was a trap door, cleverly concealed. With a deep breath, I opened it and I descended the narrow staircase that spiraled into darkness. The air grew colder as I went deeper, the oppressive silence broken only by my own breathing. At the bottom, I found myself in a hidden chamber, the walls adorned with symbols and artifacts that spoke of ancient rituals and long forgotten practices. The chamber was a stark contrast to the church above, a secret place where unspeakable acts had been performed. In the center of the room stood an altar, and above it hung the black raven mask, its empty eyes seeming to stare into my soul. As I approached, the room seemed to grow darker, the air thicker. I felt a presence, a malevolent force that had been awakened by my intrusion. It was then that the horrifying truth dawned on me. The ghostly occurrences, the whispers, the guiding spirit in the library, they were not just hauntings, but warnings. The school, built upon a land steeped in blood and darkness, had become the site of a ritual that spanned centuries, a ritual that demanded a sacrifice. I realized with a sickening jolt that I was to be the next sacrificial lamb. The teachers who had vanished over the years had been part of this twisted tradition, sacrifices made to appease the disturbed spirits of the graveyard. Age in the 20s, single, came from different towns or cities. I fit the criteria perfectly. But there was more. As I looked around the chamber, I understood that the ritual had evolved over time into something far more sinister. The original intent to honor and appease the spirits had been corrupted, twisted into a dark practice that served only to feed the malevolent entity that now resided in this place. The revelation shook me to my core. I was standing in the heart of darkness, a place where the boundary between the living and the dead was blurred. The black raven mask, a symbol of communication with the spirits, had become a tool for a dark practice. I knew I had to escape, to get out of this chamber and away from the school, but as I turned to leave, I felt the presence grow stronger. A dark force that didn't want to let me go. I was in a fight for my life, a fight against an ancient evil that had claimed this land and its people for centuries. The realization that I was meant to be the next victim in a centuries-old ritual of sacrifice sent a wave of terror through me. The hidden chamber beneath the church with its sinister symbols and the ominous black raven mask felt like a tomb. I knew I had to escape somehow to avoid the fate that had befallen so many before me. As I turned to leave, the chamber seemed to react. The air grew colder and the shadows lengthened, twisting into shapes that resembled human forms. Whispers filled the room, a cacophony of voices speaking in a language I couldn't understand. The words were strange, yet they exuded darkness. Then, the old staff of the school entered the chamber one by one, including a scared, ashamed Mrs. Nunes, whom I now realized were protectors of this dark ritual. Their eyes were devoid of warmth, their expressions twisted into sinister smiles, they began to chant in the same eerie language, moving towards me with a purpose that chilled my blood. In a moment of pure instinct, I grabbed the black raven mask from the altar. Its touch sent a jolt of energy through me, a power that felt both ancient and terrifying. Holding the mask, I felt a strange sense of empowerment as if it connected me to the very spirits it was meant to appease. The staff continued their advance, chanting louder, their words echoing off the stone walls. But I stood my ground, holding the mask in front of me like a shield. The chamber seemed to pulsate with energy, the air vibrating with the power of the ritual. Then, in a moment of desperation, I did the unthinkable. I put on the mask. 
The world around me transformed instantly. The chamber faded away, and I was standing in a different realm for some seconds, a place between the living and the dead. The spirits of the graveyard, the victims of the land's bloody history, surrounded me. They whispered to me, their voices a mixture of sorrow and rage. It could have very well been a hallucination, but I suddenly felt powerful, like I had the support of all of these spirits with me. With the spirit's guidance, I channeled the energy of the mask, turning it against the staff. The chamber reappeared, but now the staff halted their advance, their expressions turning from malevolence to fear. The power of the mask combined with the spirit's energy was overwhelming them. In a final act of defiance, I tore off the mask and hurled it at the altar. A blinding light filled the room as soon as it touched, and the chanting stopped abruptly. The staff held their heads and closed their eyes while the screams from an unknown presence filled the room. That was the window which I needed. I fled the chamber, running through the corridors of the church and out into the night. I kept running till my legs gave up, crying and panting. The school loomed behind me, its windows dark, its secrets laid bare. I knew I couldn't stay. I had to leave this place to escape the darkness that had almost claimed me. As I reached the safety of the street, I looked back one last time. The school was quiet, its haunted history a silent witness to the night's events. I had survived, but the memories of what I had experienced would stay with me forever. I promised myself that I would tell my story, that the world would know about the horrors that lay hidden beneath that old Catholic school in Kentucky. The spirits, I hope, had found some measure of peace, their stories finally brought to light. As I walked away, the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon, signaling a new beginning. The nightmare was over, but its echoes would resonate in the halls of the school for years to come. My name is Jack, and I never believed in the supernatural. Not until that fateful night at a McDonald's in my small Alabama town. Fresh out of school, the job was supposed to be a simple way to earn some cash, but what transpired that night was anything but simple. The evening began typically enough, with the usual bustle of customers in the familiar routine of preparing fast food. Fries, burger patties, buns, ice creams, more fries, apologizing to an angry customer even though it isn't your fault, few online orders here, covering the coffee shifts there, and just when you sit down to scroll a few mindless TikToks, fries again. However, as the night progressed and the customer flow dwindled, an unusual patron caught my attention, a woman in a tattered raincoat. Her hair was dark, her eyes unnervingly focused on me. She ordered a coffee and sat in a dimly lit corner of the restaurant, her gaze never wandering from my direction. It actually took me some time to figure that I was being checked out. Now, I don't mean to brag, but I have had my fair share of could cut her with this jawline moments. I was half genetics and half malnutrition that did it. But hey, if poverty can make you look sexy, what's the harm, right? Anyway, I tried to shake off the eerie feeling she gave me, dismissing it as mere fatigue or perhaps my imagination running wild. The hours ticked by and the diner gradually emptied leaving an oppressive silence in its wake. That's when my co-worker, the only other person in the restaurant, suddenly collapsed. The shock of it jolted me from the numbness of my routine. One moment, he was washing the fryer and cribbing around his girl who has a thing for his credit cards. The next moment, his face was rushing to meet the ground. I rushed to his side, finding him unconscious but breathing. I grabbed him and somehow managed to get him to his car, advising him to get some sleep. His girlfriend's place was two blocks away, so even though I offered to drop him, he was sure that he was fine. I don't know, bro, he said. Yo, one moment I was fine, and then it felt like, I don't know, like I was tied to a tree and people were burning fire all around me. The temperature rose and dropped, bro. I tell you, that refrigerator is going to be the death of me. That shit is broken, yo. The parking lot was quiet, almost unnaturally so. 
and I felt a chill in the air as I watched him drive away. Returning to the diner, I found the woman had left, but her raincoat remained, hanging over the back of the chair like a spectral reminder of her presence. Approaching her table, I noticed something peculiar, a tissue, crumpled and discarded. On it, in jagged, almost frantic handwriting, was a message that sent a shiver down my spine. Convince them, or they will think it is you. The words were ominous, cryptic, and unsettling. I pondered their meaning, a growing sense of unease taking hold of me. And as the night deepened, strange and disturbing sounds began to fill the diner. It started with soft, desperate pleas for help, voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere all at once. Then came the screams, agonizing cries that echoed through the empty restaurant, filled with pain and terror. To my growing horror, the distant crackling sound of a fire joined the party, intensifying in volume and urgency. The situation was soon spiraling into madness. I decided to leave, to escape the nightmare that was unfolding around me, but my escape was thwarted when I found the door inexplicably locked, sealed shut from the inside. I had the keys and I dropped my colleague Bill to his car. There was no way someone would have closed it. My attempts to open it were futile. So I turned, ignored the voices and the screams, and rushed to the back door, very certain at this point that whatever was happening wouldn't bring any good news. But this is when I knew that I was screwed. The back door was sealed shut as well. The realization that I was trapped inside with the escalating sounds of terror was paralyzing. The diner, once a place of mundane work, had transformed into a scene from a horror story. The cryptic message, the locked doors, the haunting sounds, all these elements intertwined, creating a tapestry of fear and confusion. I was caught in the midst of it, alone and bewildered, facing a night that was quickly turning into something out of a ghost story. Trapped inside the diner, the cacophony of screams and the crackling fire growing around me, my sense of reality began to blur at the edges. The diner, once a haven of greasy comfort food, had transformed into a nightmarish landscape. I felt a primal fear take hold, the kind that grips you in the dead of the night when every shadow seems alive. As I paced frantically, searching for any means of escape, the diner's lights flickered ominously, casting eerie shadows across the walls. It was then that I first saw them. Horrifying apparitions, figures with severe burn injuries, their expressions contorted in pain and anger. They seemed to notice me, reaching out with charred hands, only to vanish as soon as they touched me. Their presence was both terrifying and heart-wrenching. In a desperate attempt to understand what was happening, I ventured into the back of the restaurant, a section I rarely visited. There, hidden behind old storage racks, I discovered a decayed part of the building I never knew existed. I mean, I had been there a few times, but I could swear that there was a wall at that place. That was somehow gone. In its place was a small, dusty room that looked out of place, as if something from the past that didn't belong there. The walls of this small room were lined with old, yellowed newspaper clippings. My eyes were drawn to a headline that sent chills down my spine. Devastating fire at local business claims numerous lives. The date was decades ago, but then I read something which sent chills down my spine. The articles detailed a tragic fire that had occurred on these very premises back when it was a bustling furniture market. Worse yet, amidst the images of the deceased, I saw a few familiar faces. The faces in the photos matched the apparitions haunting me. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The apparitions, the sounds, they were all echoes of this tragic past. But the horror didn't stop there. As I returned, the ghost became more aggressive. Objects began to fly off shelves as if hurled by unseen forces. Knives from the kitchen counter were thrown in my direction, narrowly missing me. Scorching handprints appeared on the walls, leaving behind a smell of burnt flesh. 
I dodged and weaved, avoiding the flying debris, my mind racing. The diner was a tomb, a site of unspeakable tragedy, and I was trapped within it. The spirits of those lost in the fire were restless, their pain and anger palpable. They were reaching out to me as I ran for the door again, only to find it locked yet again. So I ran back. Amidst the chaos, I stumbled upon more clippings, revealing another layer to the tragedy. There were rumors of foul play, suspicions that the fire was no accident. The owner at the time, a Mr. Sanders, was suspected of setting the blaze for insurance money. Though nothing was ever proven, the accusations cast a dark shadow over the tragedy. The atmosphere in the diner shifted again, the temperature dropping suddenly as if the very air was being sucked away. I felt an unnerving sensation of being watched, followed by something unseen. Each step I took was heavy, filled with dread. The walls of the diner seemed to close in on me, the faces of the victims in the newspaper clippings staring accusingly. Then it happened. A vision so vivid, it was as though I was transported to another time. I found myself inside the burning furniture market, surrounded by flames. The heat was suffocating, the screams of the trapped victims piercing the air. I felt their agony, their desperation. It was a glimpse into the hellish final moments of those who perished in the fire. Emerging from the vision, gasping for air, I understood the depth of the suffering that had occurred here. The diner was not just a building. It was a grave for those lost souls, a place where their pain still lingered, their cries for justice unheard. As I stood there reeling from the vision and the revelations, I heard a voice call out, You did this! And that is when it hit me. These trapped souls mistakenly thought that I was responsible for their deaths. I, I knew I had to find a way to calm the spirits, to prove that I was not the one responsible for their anguish. The task seemed impossible, but it was the only chance I had to escape this nightmare. Still reeling from the terrifying vision of the burning furniture market, I struggled to comprehend the full extent of the tragedy that had unfolded decades ago on the very ground where the McDonald's now stood. The air in the restaurant felt heavy, charged with the anguish and despair of the lost souls. As I navigated through the chaos of the haunted diner, the temperature fluctuated wildly, plunging into an icy chill before surging to an oppressive heat that mimicked the flames of the past. The sensation of being followed by something unseen intensified, an invisible presence that seemed to hover just over my shoulder, its breath cold against my neck. In my panic state, I remembered the owner, Mr. Sanders, and the accusations leveled against him. Desperate for answers, I scoured the diner for any clues, any remnants of the past that could help me understand. That's when I noticed something I had overlooked before, a distinct ring with the letter S on Mr. Sanders' finger and an old, framed photograph on the wall. The same ring I had seen on the raincoat woman's. The connection was undeniable. The restaurant, once a lively market, now rebuilt, held within its walls the echoes of a cursed past. The whispers of the tragedy were everywhere, in the very fabric of the building. The spirits, tormented and restless, seemed to be everywhere, their presence growing stronger, more oppressive with each passing moment. Suddenly, I was gripped by another vision, more intense and terrifying than the first. I was inside the burning market again, but this time I was one of the trapped victims. I could feel the searing heat of the flames, the smoke filling my lungs, the desperation and fear. The screams of the others around me were deafening. I could hear their pleas for help, feel their struggle as the fire consumed everything. Jolted back to reality, I was left gasping for air, my heart racing. The vision had been so vivid, so real that it took me a moment to orient myself. The spirits were trying to communicate their pain, their story, through me. As I struggled to make sense of it all, the diner continued to descend into chaos. Objects were still flying off the shelves, the ghostly apparitions growing in intensity and number. The scorching handprints on the wall seemed to multiply, a terrifying reminder of the fire's deadly grip. 
It was clear that the spirits mistook me for someone else, perhaps someone involved in the tragedy. The weight of their mistaken accusations was a heavy burden, their need for justice and release palpable. I had to find a way to convince them of my innocence, to quell their anger and help them find peace. Remembering the cryptic message on the tissue left by the woman in the raincoat, I realized what I had to do. The message, convince them or they will think it is you, was a warning, a clue to resolving this nightmare. I needed to communicate with the spirits, to let them know I was not the one responsible for their suffering. As the spirits converged on me, their anger reaching a fever pitch, I remembered the woman's abandoned raincoat. Driven by instinct, I searched it and found the ring with the distinct S. It was a piece of the puzzle, a connection to the past, to the tragedy, and possibly to Mr. Sanders himself. With the ring in hand, I prepared to confront the spirits, to share my revelation and hopefully bring them the peace they so desperately sought. The diner was a whirlwind of paranormal activity, with apparitions manifesting more aggressively than ever. Kitchen utensils flew through the air as if wielded by invisible, furious hands, narrowly missing me as I ducked and weaved through the chaos. The once familiar signs and menus came crashing down around me, creating a cacophony of noise and confusion. Amidst this turmoil, messages began appearing on the windows and mirrors, scrawled in what looked like soot. The words were desperate pleas for help, interspersed with vows of revenge. It was as if the tormented souls of the fire victims were reaching out through every available surface, seeking justice or release from their eternal suffering. The realization that the spirits mistook me for someone connected to their tragedy was a terrifying burden. They saw me as the key to their release or revenge, perhaps because of my presence in this cursed place. I recalled the woman's ominous words on the tissue, convince them or they will think it is you. It was a warning, a directive that I now understood all too well. As I clutched the ring with the distinct S, a symbol connecting me to the past, to Mr. Sanders, and to the woman in the raincoat, I prepared to make my stand. The spirits converged on me, their ethereal forms swirling with anger and pain. I felt their eyes upon me, their gaze heavy with accusation. In a moment of desperate courage, I raised my voice. I'm not who you think I am! I shouted, my words seemingly lost in the chaos. But I pressed on, driven by a need to quell their anger and bring them peace. I explained that I had no connection to the fire, to the tragedy that had befallen them. I was just a worker at the diner, unwittingly caught in the midst of their anguish. Holding up the ring, I implored them to see the truth. The ring was a symbol, a piece of the past that I had inadvertently become entwined with. I spoke of the woman in the raincoat, her mysterious message, and how I came to find myself in possession of the ring. The apparitions paused, their forms flickering as if in doubt. The intensity of their anger seemed to wane, replaced by a cautious curiosity. It was a moment of respite, a chance for me to reach out to them further. I pleaded with them to understand, to recognize that I was not the architect of their suffering. I spoke of my own fears and confusion, of being thrust into a nightmare I could not comprehend. My words were a mix of apology and explanation, a desperate plea for understanding. As I spoke, the chaos around me began to subside. The flying objects settled, the crashing signs stilled, and the messages on the mirrors and windows faded. The spirits, their forms less menacing now, seemed to be listening, their need for vengeance giving way to a desire for the truth. In that moment, I realized the power of acknowledgement, of giving voice to the pain and suffering of those long silenced. The spirits, bound by their tragic past, were seeking recognition, a chance to be heard and understood. Kneeling amidst the settling chaos of the diner, I clutched the ring tightly, a symbol of a tragic past that had inadvertently become part of my present. The spirits, now less aggressive, hovered around me, their forms flickering with residual anger and confusion. Gathering all the courage I had left, I addressed the spirits, my voice echoing in the now eerily silent restaurant. I killed him. I declared, the words heavy with a significance I had only just begun to understand. 
The spirits froze, their ethereal form still, as if processing my confession. I explained, my voice trembling but resolute, that my father had worked in the furniture shop that once stood here. He perished in the fire, a victim of the tragedy that had claimed so many lives. Years later, driven by a need for justice and retribution, I had sought out Mr. Sanders, the man suspected of causing the inferno. In a moment of vengeance, I had confronted him, leading to his death. The spirits listened, their forms becoming less intimidating, more ethereal. One by one, they began to vanish, their apparitions dissolving into the air, a sign that they were finally finding peace. The knowledge that Sanders, the alleged architect of their suffering, was no longer of this world seemed to bring them the closure they needed. As the last of the spirits disappeared, the diner returned to its normal state. The oppressive atmosphere lifted, replaced by a surreal calm. I was left alone, the weight of the night's revelations heavy upon me. The door, previously locked, clicked open, as if signifying the end of the ordeal. As I stepped outside, taking in the cool night air, I saw her, the woman in the raincoat. She approached me, her expression a mixture of gratitude and sorrow. She revealed herself to be Sanders' daughter. She explained that on her previous visits to the diner, she had experienced hostility from the spirits, drawn to the family ring she carried, a ring that once belonged to her father. Realizing the connection, she had devised a plan. By leaving the coat and locking the door, she hoped to create a scenario where the spirits, believing I was innocent, would find salvation. Her actions, though drastic, were driven by a desire to appease the restless souls, including that of my father. I listened, a mix of emotions swirling within me. Relief, sadness, and a strange sense of kinship with this woman who had, in her own way, sought to right the wrongs of the past. Her apology was sincere, and in the bizarre turn of events that had unfolded, I found myself forgiving her. In a surprising gesture, she asked me out on a date, a small but significant step towards healing and moving forward from the horrors of the past. We stood there, two people connected by a shared history of loss and suffering, looking towards a future where the pain of the past could finally be laid to rest. As I walked away from the diner, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon, I felt a sense of closure. The spirits of the fire victims had found peace, and with them, a part of me had found peace too. The diner, once a site of tragedy, now stood as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of truth and reconciliation. I was unemployed and desperate. My fiancé was sick and we just had a newborn. It was up to me to bring some money in that we needed badly. I had a good job at General Motors, getting paid quite well, but I was laid off and eventually fired completely. I searched and searched for any job that would hire me, and after a couple of days of walking into every restaurant in town, I got myself an interview. It was at a small local pizza place in my small town that I grew up in. I loved this place growing up, so it was going to be cool to see how the food was made after all these years. They needed a driver and I of course accepted. I got the hang of everything quickly as the job really is as simple as it sounds. I didn't even have to make the food, unlike what I expected. My one and only job was to take the pizza to the customers and keep a polite mannerism while doing so. The money obviously wasn't great, but it paid the bills, which was the most important part. I worked here for maybe five months and nothing bad really happened until the last week that I worked there. I put my two weeks in after this incident and ended up leaving before the two weeks were even up. I got an order for a pizza, and just like normal, I got in my car and headed that way. Up until this point, the worst thing about being a pizza delivery driver for me, and the only horrific thing to happen, if you even want to call it that, was when the customer didn't tip, which happened at least twice a night. On average, I would deliver about 10 or so pizzas a night, and there was always that one guy or grouchy woman who wouldn't tip. It sucked, but it was just part of the job. I'm pretty sure what I experienced this night was far more horrific than a mean troll of a woman not tipping every once in a while. The house was in a rural area, which definitely added a sprout of creepiness, but also curiosity. 
pulled into the driveway and I couldn't see the house. There were trees all in the front yard and I was starting to get nervous. It doesn't sound scary, but I've heard horror stories that start out like this before. And little did I know, I was about to become one of those stories. I crept up the driveway until I saw the front porch. I stopped the car immediately and walked up there quickly, but also quietly. I knocked on the door and then I noticed after waiting for a minute, there was a piece of paper with tape on it on the ground that looked like it may have fallen from the door with 40 bucks taped to the back of it. It said, please bring the pizza inside. Just set it right in front of the door. That's when I really started feeling queasy. I really did not want to do that. So I set the pizza down on the porch and went back to my car. I wish I would have just left like I was planning to, but I felt guilty for not doing what the note asked. So after debating with the devil and the angel on my shoulder for probably five minutes, I hustled out of the car and back up to the porch. I opened the front door and set the pizza down quickly. Hello? Anyone there? Pizza's here. Nobody answered, but I heard something that spooked me, so I ran away. I went to close the door on my way out, but I left it cracked open by accident. There was a man that came trampling outside a few seconds too late. He was wearing all black clothing and a creepy old man mask. He had a large shiny object in his hand, which I assumed was a knife. I drove out of there as fast as I could and my heart was beating through my chest. I had just escaped being murdered by only a few seconds. Okay, great. That just happened, I said to myself. I couldn't believe it. All those horror stories you hear growing up and eventually something like it happening to you. It felt like the world was ending, even though I knew I was safe. I kept having nightmares back to that night when I was driving away from him. He would chase me down and ram me off the road. And then ultimately, it usually ended with him murdering me. This evil man has never been found as far as I know. Of course I called the police, but nobody owns a house just like we all expected. I was almost the victim of a horrifying trap. Always listen to your gut. This is a scary experience that I had when I used to work at Starbucks. I was an employee there several years ago and worked there for almost two years. This was towards the end of my time working there. One time I was working a closing shift. We closed at 8 p.m. every night, and generally, I would stay for a few minutes after finishing tasks on this night. For the last few hours that we were open, I was working with one other co-worker. Things were pretty quiet for most of the day, but when it got to be at around 6 p.m., it was especially quiet. We had very few customers come in, and during the seventh hour, had nobody at our location. And it wasn't even that busy of an area, but a lot of people would still go there during the morning, usually. A few people would come inside and work on their laptops or whatever throughout the afternoon and night. Not this time, though, which I did not have a problem with. We were able to start cleaning and stuff a little bit early, and it became apparent that we probably wouldn't get any more customers for the rest of the night. At maybe 7.45 or so, I told my co-worker that she could go home and I would finish up with everything. I knew she was in school and had a lot of homework to do, so she left, and then it was just me. At probably 7.55, I went into the back room. I was doing some of the normal tasks that I would do when we closed. I spent about two or three minutes in the back room area, and then I was going to go back out when we had a large swinging door with a small window in it that separated behind the counter from the back room area. As I was about to walk through, though, I just barely noticed something through the window that made me stop there. It appeared to be someone behind the counter. This was really strange. I hadn't heard anyone come inside or anything, and it wasn't my coworker. It was a man, and he was somewhat tall, or at least a lot taller than I am. At first, he looked like he was wearing a hat, but when he turned a little, I saw that it was a mask, a full ski mask, and he was near the cash register at that point. I realized that this guy was probably trying to rob us. I quickly moved back from the door and went farther into the back room. 
I felt like an idiot for not just locking the doors and closing early. He entered when I was in the back and didn't even notice as I walked farther back there. I suddenly heard footsteps walking towards the door where I was. We had a decent-sized back area, but there's still not a whole lot of space there. Uh, Mostly, it was filled with various boxes of all sizes and extra supplies, such as ingredients and, and cups. The first thing that I thought to do was to find a large box in the back corner. Being the small female that I am, I jumped inside of it while trying not to make any noise. I'm barely five foot tall and fit inside just fine. Then I grabbed another large empty box on the shelf next to me and covered myself with it. However, the man did not immediately enter the back room. I was expecting the door to open for the entire time I was getting in the box, but it didn't. I'm not sure what he did, but he remained on the other side of the door for a little while. I had my phone in my pocket still, luckily, and I took it out and called the police. Probably 30 seconds after I called, I heard the door to the back room open. I hung up the call with the police prematurely as soon as I heard that I didn't want the guy to hear everything, even though I had been talking as quietly as I could. All that I had been able to say was the Starbucks location that I was at, and that I thought I was being robbed, and the operator was asking me a question when I hung up the phone. I hoped that the police would still come and arrive quickly when the man entered the back room. He walked in and then seemed to stop just moments later. I heard him walking closer to me. As he did, he mumbled a few things that I couldn't make out. My heart was racing like crazy and I hoped that he wouldn't find me. Now, I was hidden pretty good, but it was still a terrifying situation to be in. He got within probably 10 feet of me and then turned and walked back a short time later. I heard the door behind the counter open and close again. After that, I didn't hear a whole lot. I stayed hidden where I was and didn't dare leave. I texted some friends and family and was in the box for maybe 30 minutes. Then I heard some more noises coming from inside. Before long, I realized that it was the police. I found out that the guy had left before they got there. Unfortunately, I told them everything I could, and we went right behind the counter for the cash register. He was wearing a ski mask the whole time, so it was impossible to tell his identity. He stole everything that was in the register and then left. After talking with the police, I was finally able to go home. I found out later that the man who robbed the store was caught. I didn't want to work any closing shifts for a while afterwards, though. I think I worked there for another month or two before I quit. Sometimes I wonder if the guy was watching the store from outside and saw me go into the back. I really have no idea, though. Either way, it was good timing that I wasn't back there when he entered. I wouldn't want to know what would have happened. I had a terrifying experience with a clown back when I was in high school. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. It all started one night when I was at work. Back then, I lived with my parents and worked a job at a nearby convenience store. I walked to and from work, and I would ride the bus to school every day. Between work and school, I was pretty busy. So I started work from 3 p.m. until 9 p.m. on this night. Work went by as usual and when I got off, I left to walk home. The walk would take me about 15 minutes on most days, and I didn't mind it. At my job, I would just be sitting at a counter most of the time, so walking afterwards felt nice. Also, the neighborhood was generally really quiet. I never felt unsafe or had anything scary happen. It did seem a little bit creepy at night sometimes because of how quiet it would be. After leaving work, I started walking along the sidewalk. There were sidewalks for my entire walk home, but I did have to turn a couple of times. About two or three minutes into the walk, I noticed somebody kind of up ahead. They were standing on the grass between the sidewalk and the street, kind of randomly. It was dark out and they were far away, but when I approached, I soon realized that it was a clown, or at least it was somebody dressed up in a clown costume. It was really creepy looking, and I knew that I would have to walk past him. I didn't really want to, but I did. I tried not to look when I got close, and the clown didn't say anything to me. 
When I passed it by, I could sense him looking at me though. Still, I didn't look. I just walked past and kept going towards my house. At first, he appeared to stay where he was. But when I got like 20 feet away, I heard him move, and it sounded like he went onto the sidewalk. I got about 50 feet ahead of him, but then I heard him walking behind me. I hoped that he wasn't following me, but I had a bad feeling that he was. When I turned, I looked over and saw that the clown was walking a distance behind me. He turned exactly when I did. There was no question that he was following me. I kept going and tried to walk a little bit faster. I didn't look back, but listened closely in case the clown was going faster as well. He didn't seem to be getting any closer to me though. I crossed another street, which he also did. Now I only had a short distance to go before arriving home. When I got to my street, the clown walked after me. That's when I looked over my shoulder for the first time. He was there, maybe 40 feet back now, and was looking at me. I walked faster, and by now my heart was racing. I was really freaked out. I wanted to start running, but was afraid that the clown would do the same if I did. Instead, I remained as calm as I could and kept walking. Soon, I made it to my driveway. I felt a lot better, but still had to make it inside the house. I walked up and got to the front step. It was at that point that the clown reached my driveway. Then, I heard him starting to walk up the driveway after me. This made me really nervous, and I scrambled to use my house key to unlock the door. I was panicking, and that was causing me to go slower than usual. I heard the footsteps quickly approaching as I fumbled around with the key. At last, I had unlocked the door. I went inside extremely quick and then slammed the door and locked it behind me. I heard my mom say from the other room, what was that? She then called out my name and I heard the doorknob turn behind me. I ran over to the living room and found my parents. I told them about the clown guy following me home. We went over to the door to look, but he was now gone. I told them the story and my parents said that they would drive me to and from work for my next shift. We figured that the clown had left and we were all very creeped out by this situation. Later that night, I went to bed, and the clown didn't come back or anything. But the next morning, I got up to catch the bus for school. It was really early and still dark out because school started at 7.25. So at about 6.50, the bus would usually arrive at my house. And after getting ready for school, I headed out. I left my house at about 6.45 and started walking to the end of my driveway where I would stand and wait for the bus. When I was beginning to walk down the driveway, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked and saw the same clown coming around the corner from the side of the garage. I couldn't believe my eyes. I turned and ran back inside the house and called the police right there. Then I found my parents and told them what was going on. We all stayed inside the house until the cops got there. They found the clown hiding in the backyard. I couldn't believe it. I was sure that he had left the previous night. After that, I was able to get a ride with my parents to school because I missed the bus but I was just grateful to be okay. It still blows my mind that the clown was there in our yard all night. We should have called the police the previous night after he had followed me home. We had just assumed that he left. I guess he camped out on the side of the garage, which was actually a really good hiding place. That guy was a total creep. This remains the scariest moment of my life. I'm now scared of clowns because of it. I currently work at Starbucks, and I've been working there for a little over a year. This is something that took place last summer. It was a crazy experience, to say the least. It all happened one very busy morning. I had been working since we opened, but at this point it was probably a little bit after 8am. Lots of people were coming in and ordering, and there were five of us working, trying to keep up. We were doing a pretty good job. I thought some people order Starbucks online and pick it up or use things like DoorDash or Uber Eats. Between those and the people ordering in the store, there were several drinks on the counter. I remember seeing probably five drinks at least or a couple of food items that we sold, such as breakfast sandwiches. A few people were standing around waiting for their orders to be done as well. We didn't have a separate shelf for mobile or online orders at the time, which we have since added, so every order that was done just got placed on the counter. I remember as I put a drink down on the counter, I noticed one guy walking in. He had longer hair and a beard that looked unkempt. I turned around to keep working as we were very busy. 
A short time later, another order got added to the counter, and a couple of people had picked theirs up. I saw the man was now standing nearby. Probably five minutes later, I added another drink to the counter, which probably had about six or seven things on it. That's when I saw the man walk up at first. I assumed that he had ordered something online and was picking it up, but after the guy got right up to the counter, he took his arm and knocked everything over. He used his arm like a brush, and within seconds seconds, every single drink that was on there got knocked over and spilled. It was a mess, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Afterwards, the man took a step back and started laughing like a maniac. A bunch of people around him were giving him dirty looks. Somebody asked him why he did that. Other than that, the place quickly became dead silent. He just kept laughing, as if it was the funniest thing ever. I was angry, but I knew that I couldn't lose my temper. For some reason, though, I took it upon myself to deal with the situation, probably because I was closest to the man. I took a few steps over to the guy and he looked at me. Before I said anything, the man said to me, what are you going to do about it? It was as if he was very proud of what he had done. I asked him to just leave. The guy said no. I thought that the guy must be crazy or something. Some other people were telling him that he should leave and he turned to them and started defending himself. I went back to help another order that we were finishing up. Then we were going to try to figure out everything that needed to be remade. Probably just about 30 seconds later, I heard the man moving closer. I looked and then saw him jumping over the counter. I walked over to him and told him to stop. The man was now facing me and standing behind the counter where it was for employees only. I tried telling the man to leave, but clearly he wasn't going to listen. He then grabbed something off the shelf. It was a container of caramel or something, and then he threw it at me. It didn't really hurt, but I was afraid of what the man would do next. He seemed very unpredictable. Somebody shouted to call the police, and the man then charged at me. He wasn't very big, and I was several inches taller than him. He ran into me, but with not a whole lot of force. It didn't knock me over or anything. I put my hands up to stop him, and then he fell over. He crashed into the counter behind us and to the right. I remembered when he was on the ground, he then yelled at me that he was going to sue me for assaulting him. A lot of people started leaving the building, and nobody was trying to get coffee anymore. When the man stood back up, I pleaded with him to leave. He refused and tried to charge at me again. I grabbed the man by his arms and tried to force him to leave. I walked with him out and around the counter. I heard one of my co-workers say that the police were on their way. Everybody who was inside the restaurant left, and as I finally made it out from behind the counter, the man broke free from me. Obviously, I wasn't going to try to tackle him or anything. He then ran over to a table and stood behind it. All of my co-workers left the building as well as all of the customers. The police got there about two minutes later and we let them handle it. They were able to get the man out and leave the building. We ended up being closed for the next hour and finally opened a while later. That was by far the craziest thing that has ever happened to me while working there. This happened when I was a freshman in high school. During this time, I lived at home with my parents and older sister. We lived in what I would describe as a pretty average neighborhood. Our backyard was sort of big, but overall it was a very populated area. So one night, I was at home playing video games in my bedroom. My sister was in her room and my parents were out in the living room. I always liked to play video games in my room and I had a really good setup in there. I had my gaming chair, big monitor, and a TV as well. I remember that after gaming for a long time, I got to a loading screen. I leaned back in my chair to stretch and I casually looked to my right out of my bedroom window. The window looked out to the backyard, and at the back of the yard was a small woods. Something caught my eye when I looked out there. It looked sort of like there was a clown looking at me from just inside the woods. At first, I thought surely that wasn't the case. I kept looking and was squinting my eyes to see better. It sure looked like there was a clown there. 
so I got up from my chair and walked over to the window. Now that I had a better view, I could see that there was in fact a clown there, or at least somebody that was wearing a clown mask. They were standing just a couple of feet into the woods, partially blocked by trees. But the clown was looking right at our house, possibly at my window. It was extremely creepy to see this. I ran out of my bedroom and found my parents in the living room. I told them there was some guy dressed as a clown in the backyard. They followed me to my bedroom window, but when we got there, whoever this guy was was now gone. I told my parents where he was and everything. We all went outside after that and looked around the backyard, although I was really creeped out. Luckily, we didn't see or hear anything when we were out there. The woods in our backyard was not that big. It only went back probably 20 feet, and then there was a fence. I was guessing whoever this guy was went through the neighbor's yard. At least he wasn't in our yard anymore. It was a real mystery as to who he was and what exactly he was doing back there. We all went back inside, and I went back to what I was doing. I looked out of my window every so often, but luckily, the clown man did not return. The next couple of days were normal, no signs of the clown or anything. But it was less than a week later, and I found myself home alone. My parents were gone at friends, and my sister was at a friend's house also. I was playing video games in my bedroom, and it was probably about 9 o'clock at night. It was the same setup as the previous time. I randomly looked out of my window, which was to my right, about 15 feet away. I saw the clown guy again. This time, he was not in the woods though, but standing in the middle of the backyard, much closer. He was facing me and looking directly at my window. I got up and ran over to the window and covered it with my shades. I then ran out of my bedroom as quickly as possible. I didn't know what to do. Why would the clown guy come back? I called my parents and told them about it. They advised me to call the police if he didn't leave the yard immediately. So I looked out of another window, but I didn't see the guy anymore. I was hoping that meant that he left. I got off the phone with my parents and then looked out of several other windows. I didn't see the clown. Then I headed back to my bedroom. When I was walking in though, I heard a knock at the front door. I went over and checked out the front window and saw the clown. He was standing on the front step. I just moved away from there and ignored it. I went back into my bedroom, put my headphones on, and forced myself to just play video games. I did that until my parents got back home. When they did, the clown guy was long gone. After that night, I kept my bedroom window covered at all times. I also didn't stay home by myself for several weeks because I was too creeped out to. I'm not sure if the clown guy ever came back or not, but I didn't see him or hear from him again. I used to have a Costco membership, but I had to cancel it after what was one of the creepiest experiences of my life. It all started last summer. I would shop at Costco every single week. I had a routine that I would go every Saturday morning and buy all of my items for the week. I would usually get most of the same items as well. Most of it was food and things like that, and it would usually take me less than 30 minutes to get it all done. The membership saved me lots of money because I used it so frequently. Plus, there was a Costco just over five minutes away from my house. One time, I went to Costco like any other and then returned back home. Everything was fine, and later in the day, I got the mail. I lived in a small but nice house in a pretty typical neighborhood. When I got my mail, most of it was just bills and advertisements, but I had this one letter that stood out from the rest. It was typed, but seemed like an actual letter because it wasn't professional looking or anything. There was no return address, and it didn't say who it was from either, but it did say, please read. When I opened it up, it was a typed letter on one piece of paper to me. The letter said, Hi, you're a beautiful woman, and I love to watch you shop every week at Costco. I'm writing you this because I want to meet you sometime soon. After I read this, I thought to myself, is somebody stalking me or is this a joke? I didn't really know though. I had never noticed anybody following me around Costco or anything. I never went when it was all that busy either, so I thought I would have noticed. Usually, it would be about 10 a.m. when the store was still fairly quiet. I considered not going to Costco the next week. Ultimately though, I chose to go. I wanted to save money, and I figured that it was just a dumb joke or something. When the next Saturday came, I went back to the Costco at my usual time. 
It opened at 9.30, and I would get there at about 10 and be gone by 10.30. I started doing my normal shopping, going down all of the aisles I typically did, getting all of the products. I was careful to pay attention to if somebody was following me or not, but I didn't notice anyone. About halfway through, I was in one of the aisles towards the back of the store. On each side of the aisles, there were lots of pallets on the ground. There would be products on the pallets that you can buy. If you've never been to Costco before, you can buy things in bulk and the store is kind of like a giant warehouse. Most of the products are not displayed the way that they are at maybe a Target or a Walmart. So I was shopping and for whatever reason looked to the right. There were these products on pallets and behind the products I saw a man hiding back there. He was far back and hidden really well. He was also looking right at me. When I saw him, he quickly ducked down. I walked away and immediately went to the checkouts. This guy had to be the one who wrote me the letter. I didn't get a great look at him, but he seemed to be in his 20s and had darker hair. When I got to the checkout, I told the employee at the register about him. She said that she would talk to her manager about it. I just wanted to leave though, and I figured that the guy would probably leave or hide before they got there. I left and that same day canceled my Costco membership. There was no way that I could go back there. This really creeped me out because apparently some guy had been watching me every time that I shopped. I had no idea because he probably hid in the aisles just about every time. Later that night, I was at home by myself and got a knock on the door at like 8 p.m. I got up and went to the window and looked outside. It was the same guy that had been hiding in the Costco. My heart started racing. He knocked again after I didn't answer the door right away. I stayed in the living room and just wanted him to leave. After about five minutes, he knocked once more. I still was not going to answer. I stayed where I was, and after a little while, I thought that he left until I heard a knock coming from the back side of my house. He was now at the back door. This was creeping me out too much, and I called the police on him. He wasn't trying to break in, but was certainly trying hard to get me to answer. I didn't know what he was going to do if I did. He didn't knock for a long time, and I think then that he actually left. When the police got there, they looked around outside and couldn't find the guy anywhere. They said that if he came back, for me to not hesitate to call. For the rest of that night, though, he didn't come back. I didn't see him for several days and was not going to go back to Costco either. But later that week, I got another letter from him. This letter was a little bit longer than the first. He said that he was disappointed that I didn't want to talk to him and even more disappointed that I called the police on him. But then he said that he was sorry and was not going to bother me anymore. I was really surprised to read that, but the crazy thing is that after that letter, I haven't heard from him or seen him since. It's amazing to me how he stopped after going to such lengths. I mean, he found out where I lived and watched me while hiding inside of Costco. I guess he had enough common sense to know that I got the police involved and he would possibly get in some serious trouble if he continued. Either way, I'm glad that I haven't seen him since, and I hope that I never see him or hear from him again. I want to start by saying that this isn't the first bad experience I've had dog sitting, but it's definitely the worst. So I started dog sitting back when I was around 13 or so, and I made good money doing it. I'm currently 19, and this happened when I was 18. I set up an easy way for people to contact me about dog sitting. I would put out posts on Facebook and Instagram about it often and I would get people on my messages asking to dog sit. One day I got a notification from Instagram stating someone was trying to message me. I accepted it and the message said that me and my wife are looking to find a dog sitter while we go away for a week to Florida. You will have to work from the 4th to the 11th this month. We will pay you $300 for the week and you're welcome to stay at our house or go back to your own home. I started talking back and forth with this man and we're going to call him Mr. Brown for the sake of privacy. So I agreed to take the gig and I told him I would stay at his house for the week. Once I got to his house, I was introduced to his two dogs, Mina and Letty. Mina was a little Yorkie and Letty was a blue hound. I was shown around his house, which was surrounded by 76 acres. I live in a farm town and live on 32 acres myself, so staying here didn't really freak me out. The closest neighbors were pretty far away and you would actually have to drive there if you wanted to talk to them. They told me the rules and when to feed them and all that. Then Miss Brown told me about their nearest neighbor. 
In her words, she was a nice person, just a little bit drugged up and confused. She mentioned how sometimes she would pull into their driveway instead of hers, and would sometimes mistake Miss Brown for her dead daughter. Hearing this made me feel pretty bad for her, and I know all too well how hard it is for parents to lose their child because of how my parents were after losing my brother in a car accident. Miss Brown said she shouldn't do anything bad though, and that if she came up to the house, to just point her back home and that she should leave with no problems. After they left, I was down to watch movies and just chill with the dogs. The first two days were fine with no hiccups. The third day, however, the old woman, who I'll call Miss Rose, did pull into the driveway. I came outside as she was getting out of the car, and she looked up to see me immediately, and then she got back in her car and left. I chalked it up to her realizing it was the wrong house when she saw me and went back inside. Later that night though, I got a call from Miss Brown asking if I was okay. I said yes and asked why. She then went on to tell me about how she got a call from Miss Rose and that she said there was a robber at their house. I explained what happened and she just laughed and said that she must have been confused and forgot that they were out of town. I ended the phone call, making a note to go over there tomorrow to clear the air about me being a robber. Once I went to bed that night though, things got crazy. I woke up around 2am, hearing a light scratching sound that almost sounded like ticking coming from outside the window. At first I thought it might have been a bird or some sort of creature and I left it alone. But as the noise kept me from falling back asleep, I wanted to scare it away so I got up and went to open the blinds but I screamed when I lifted the blinds at the sight of Miss Rose trying to pry the window open with a pair of pliers. Once I was spotted through the window, she started banging on it with the pliers. The dogs started going crazy and I quickly got up. I told the dogs to follow me. I then grabbed my phone and ran to a room with no windows, which was the bathroom. I called 911 and explained the situation quickly giving them the address from what I could remember. She said that the police would be there in about 10 minutes, which for the area I was in was pretty good considering the house is in a pretty rural area. I had gotten the dogs to be quiet and put them in the closet connected to the bathroom to make sure she didn't hear them. I was trying to stay calm and I could still hear the pounding on the window. As I continued to talk to the operator, I heard glass shatter. I cursed under my breath, trying not to cry. I was really scared at this point and pretty much ready to cry from the fear of being beaten to death by someone who was clearly not in the right state of mind. I was whispering what was happening to the operator hiding in the back of the bathroom in the tub. After about four minutes of pretty much silence, I heard footsteps and I could see feet under the other side of the door, and I cursed to myself again. I then see Miss Rose get on her hands, looking under the crack, and I mistakenly let out a gasp. She gets up quickly, pounding at the door. I can tell she's still using the pliers. I am at this point crying, asking the operator where the police are, to which she responds, three minutes. Those three minutes felt like longer than forever. I screamed at Miss Rose to please go away, and she screamed back that I shouldn't be here. Once I heard the sound of police cars, and about a minute later, them trying to kick down the door though, I felt a lot better. I was told to stay on the line till the intruder was caught, and that police were trying to get into the house. Eventually they did get into the house, and I yelled to get their attention as if they even needed it, because the lady was still banging on the door. Once they got into the room, she was told to drop her weapon, and she actually obeyed saying that she didn't do anything wrong. They got her in handcuffs, and a police officer told me it was okay to unlock the door, to which I slowly got up and did so. After being taken to the police station and giving them my story for the report, I went to my parents' house. I was just too scared to be alone. The next day, I called Miss Brown and explained the situation. I even got full payment after telling them I wasn't going back to the house. They called me a few days later, saying that Miss Rose was under the influence of hard drugs and... In her words, she told the police that she decided to take care of the robber, me, herself, and that she did nothing wrong. She was charged with breaking and entering, which is kind of ironic. After that, I quit dog sitting, and I'm a lot more paranoid nowadays, and always make sure my doors and windows are locked. I'm a former Costco member. If you don't know what Costco is, you pay a monthly fee in order to shop at the store. The prices are a little bit cheaper and you can buy things in bulk, which is why there's a membership. The store is massive and they also have a gas station at most locations. This is generally at the back of the parking lot and you can get cheaper gas if you're a member. When I was a member there, the store would always be super busy. When I shopped, 
People would seemingly be everywhere. The area was pretty populated, so it made sense, but it still surprised me. Even more busy than the store, though, was the gas station. I know how everybody goes crazy over gas prices, so I think all of the members like to get gas at Costco. I would always get my gas there when I was a member because I would save a lot of money. Plus, I only lived about 10 minutes away from the store. One time, I had to go grocery shopping at Costco and get gas as well. I was almost out when I pulled into the parking lot, saw a long line of cars for the gas station. This was not all that uncommon, but I had never seen it quite as long as it was on this particular day. There were four gas pumps, so eight total cars could be fueling at once. Costco had a few employees out there to work near the gas station, and had two people literally there to help control the line. It would have been chaos without them, but even with them, it was bad. There were two main lines of cars, and probably five to ten cars in each line. That's how backed up it was. I considered waiting until later to get gas, but ultimately decided to just get in the back of the line. I went into the left line and committed to it. Things actually started to move faster than I expected them to. I moved up a couple of spaces, but was still last in line. Soon some other people joined in behind me and in the next line over as well. Luckily for me, the line that I was in for some reason was moving faster than the other one. I guess I just got lucky. When there was just one car in front of me waiting to get gas, somebody left. The car in front of me moved up. I was about to drive up and then I would be on deck, but as I started driving, I saw the car in the other line to the right try pulling in front of me. I couldn't believe it. This guy was supposed to stay in his line. Nobody was just switching lines. I didn't let him in and quickly pulled forward. He had to stop and then was like diagonal between the line that he had been in and my line. He then honked at me, but I didn't care. After that though, I saw his door open up. He actually got out and started yelling at me. He was a bigger guy, but not that tall. He had a dark mustache and his head was shaved. I rolled down my window a little and yelled back to stay in his line. The guy started cursing and yelling at me, saying how I wasn't moving up fast enough and he was in a hurry. He started going, some of us have places to be. The guy was causing a whole scene. Someone else actually rolled down their window and told him to get back inside of his car. Within minutes, one of the employees that was working over there came over and tried to calm the guy down. He finally went back inside of his vehicle. Then it was finally my turn to get gas. I did and then left the gas station and headed to the Costco parking lot. I parked my car and then went inside. When I was inside, I got a cart and started shopping for the things that I was getting. Not a whole lot, just a few food items. I pushed my cart down one aisle and got some things. As I was pushing my cart further to the back of the store, I heard another person walking behind me. I didn't think anything of it. The person was walking really fast and passed me on the right side. When they passed me, I saw who it was, the same guy who had yelled at me before. After passing me, he went right in front of my cart and then abruptly stopped. I had to stop quickly, and my cart hit the guy in his back a little. He then turned around and asked me what my effing problem was and flipped me off. I had enough of this guy. I told him to leave me alone and I was tired of his nonsense, but probably didn't say it quite like that. The guy cursed at me one more time and then walked away. I watched him go back towards the front of the store. I was really glad to see him gone. Our interaction inside the store lasted for no more than a minute. I was able to continue my shopping without any more problems. I looked around almost constantly to make sure that I wouldn't go near the guy in case he was still inside the store. I just wanted to avoid him because he seemed to be nothing but trouble. But luckily, I didn't see him for the rest of the time that I was shopping in there. I checked out and then left the store. I walked back to my car in the parking lot, only to see that it was all scratched up. The guy had keyed my car. My car is black, and both sides had about four or five long scratch marks on them. I was so angry and knew exactly who had done it. I called the police right there and waited for them to arrive. Then I told them the whole story. I didn't know the man's name or license plate, but I did know his car. Plus, I figured that he was a Costco member. He ended up being located and was forced to pay for my car to be repaired. He was also banned from Costco. After that experience though, I hope that I never see him again. I no longer have a Costco membership. That's not the reason why I stopped it. I just prefer to go to other stores now. I will never forget that experience though. 
This happened not that long ago. I went to the grocery store one night that was kind of near my house. It was only like 10 minutes away. I was inside the grocery store for maybe 30 minutes. Inside, things were not very busy, and it was maybe 9 p.m. When I left the grocery store, I went back to my car, which was parked at about the middle of the parking lot. There were cars scattered all around, but not too many. I noticed that there was a car parked right next to mine, though, that wasn't there before. I only really noticed it because there were lots of open spaces around it. The car parked next to mine was a silver-colored sedan. I didn't pay it much attention and started loading my groceries into the back of my car. But when I was just about done, I glanced over at the car that was parked next to me and noticed somebody sitting in the driver's seat. It appeared to be a man and he was wearing a clown mask. This mask in particular was really creepy looking. It wasn't one of those cheap ones, but a really detailed one. I didn't know why he was wearing it because it wasn't anywhere near Halloween. It just seemed kind of random and odd. He wasn't looking at me though. I put my cart back and then went to my driver's door and got inside. It was then that I looked over and noticed that the clown guy was looking right at me from inside his car. He didn't wave or move or anything, but was just staring in my direction. I smiled at him, figuring that it was some kind of a joke. Then I started my engine and drove away. As soon as my car started, he started his car as well. When I began driving, he did the same. I watched his car follow mine to the end of the parking lot, and I was worried. Immediately, it seemed like this clown guy was trying to follow me. I left the parking lot and went onto a quiet road, and then that one took me to a busier one. The clown drove behind me the whole way. The roads were pretty quiet with it being later at night. There was not a good chance that he could get stuck in traffic trying to follow me or something. If it was rush hour, that might have been a possibility. Instead. He easily stayed on my tail as I drove down the highway. After maybe five minutes there, I was getting worried of what I would do. I couldn't let this guy follow me all the way back home. So when I was driving, I called my boyfriend to tell him the situation. He was really confused when I told him a clown was following me on the highway. He thought I was joking at first and started laughing. I told him that I was serious and this was not a joke. Still, he didn't seem to take it as serious as I was. I told him that I was going to drive to his house. My boyfriend's house is about five minutes away from mine. He said that was fine with him and told me not to worry about it. I did feel a little bit better knowing he wasn't too concerned, but still, this clown guy was really creeping me out. It's one thing to dress as a clown later at night, but it's another to follow somebody home. Several minutes later, I exited the highway followed by the clown. Then I took a quiet road for about a mile before the turnoff for my boyfriend's street. When I turned, the clown behind me did as well. The street was very quiet at this time of night. My boyfriend's house was about halfway down the street and on the right side. When I reached it, I began pulling into the driveway. It seemed as though the clown was going to do the same thing. That's when I saw the door to the house open and my boyfriend running out. He was wearing a clown mask of his own, one that he wore at a Halloween party a couple of years ago. He was holding a yellow wiffle ball bat as well and waving it around like a crazy person. The clown in the car behind me started pulling into the driveway and then stopped. My boyfriend was screaming like a madman and went running straight for the clown's car behind me. Then the clown backed out and drove away before my boyfriend could reach him. I got out of the car and asked my boyfriend if he was out of his mind. I couldn't believe what he was doing. He took his mask off and started laughing, calling the other clown a wimp for running away. We went inside after that, and I ended up being really glad that he did that. It could have been extremely dangerous though. Who knows who that guy in the clown mask was and what he wanted. Maybe that was just his way of disguising himself, and me being a young woman he was trying to stalk me. I'm really not sure, but I'm glad that my boyfriend considered the whole thing one big joke. He told me that he thought of the idea when I told him I was going to his place. He remembered the clown mask and thought he would out-clown the clown. I'm really glad that it worked. When I was 19, I worked for a small town pizza delivery company near my house. I worked here as a means to save up money while I was in college. I lived with my parents, so I didn't have many expenses. I was able to live fairly frugally and save around 80% of my money, which was nice. After a couple of months of working there, the manager quickly gave me a promotion. He really liked my work ethic 
but of course, with a raise comes more responsibility. Instead of just making the pizza, I was now responsible for picking up the phone and sometimes doing dishes and even delivering the pizza myself. I actually enjoyed delivering pizza. That was my favorite part of my job because it barely felt like I was working. Most nights I would walk away with $75 or more in tips, plus my $12 an hour wage, which wasn't horrible for the time being. I enjoyed driving around and listening to music while doing my deliveries. I've always known it was a somewhat dangerous job, especially delivering at night in unfamiliar areas in either a rough part of town or in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes, unfortunately, you also run into the non-tippers or people that try to make your life a living hell. I was pretty stoic though, and I was very good at keeping my composure when things like this would happen. However, this night in particular was something else and caught me off guard completely. There was a man that would call our restaurant every so often and he would always say something weird, but then he would hang up right after, sort of like a prank call. One time he said he was going to bang my mom and another time he asked me how my skin tasted. We always knew it was him because of the caller ID, but we weren't allowed to block him. Company etiquette, I guess. Eventually, I just stopped answering his calls altogether. After some time, he stopped calling, thankfully, but he called again months later and I picked up the phone. Right away, I recognized his voice and realized who I was talking to. Except this time, he said he actually wanted a pizza and he wasn't being weird like usual. He even apologized to me and said that he won't do it again and that he just wants a pizza fair and square. He even said that he will tip the driver we send out, $30, in an effort to apologize. Unfortunately, I wasn't really allowed to say no to a customer anyways. My manager wasn't there, and he had just left a few minutes before, and I wasn't going to send one of the teenagers out there in the middle of the night to deal with this creepy guy, so I decided to do it myself. I didn't think anything would happen to me, and I thought I could hold my ground. I took his order and I wrote down his address. When the pizza was done, I stepped to my car and off I was to his house. The closer I got, the more I realized that maybe this wasn't a great situation to be in. I got this sinking feeling inside that felt like disparity. It was about a 12 minute drive or so, which wasn't too far, but it was, however, right on the county line. If it would have been another mile away, it would have been out of our delivery range. I knew I had to deliver this pizza, and it was too late to turn around. I turned onto the dirt road, and before I could fully realize what I was getting myself into, I was at the house. I stopped and stared at the creepy tall white house for a minute. It was pitch black, with not a single person in sight, nor a sign of life at all. I got out of my car, and when my headlights shut off, I could barely see anything in front of me thought about leaving the pizza on the porch, but I knew that wasn't proper and could look bad on the company. Plus, I remembered the $30 tip that he promised. Before I even knocked, the door swung open and creaked the whole way. It was a bald man, middle-aged, probably around 40 or so. Hey Josh, nice to finally meet you, the man said. How did he know my name? I stopped and stared and realized he probably read my name tag on my shirt. Still, it was extremely creepy given the circumstances. Your total is $23.22, sir. He looked at me for a prolonged period of time with a creepy smile on his face before saying, Okay. That was all he said. I was waiting for him to hand me the money, but he was just looking at me with his soulless eyes. Then, that was right when he said one of the most uncomforting things that anyone has ever said to me. Has anyone ever tried to hurt you before? You know, while doing these deliveries, he asked. I looked at him with confusion and said, No, um, what do you mean? Oh, nothing, he exclaimed. I just wondered. There are a lot of weirdos out here, so you never know. His grin became wider, like his devilish plan was about to unfold. I got a surge of energy and paranoia that bolted from my chest and I told him that I had to leave before getting my tip or even giving him his change. I ran to my car and just then, I heard footsteps to my right approaching me from the distance in the darkness. Luckily I was faster than them and I made it to my car safely. 
I looked behind me as I slammed my door shut and turned the car on. There were two grown men standing right in front of my car, and one of them had a baseball bat in his hands. And they both had ski masks on. I beelined out of there and never looked back. As I was backing out, I ran over a man that I hadn't seen yet that was also wearing a mask. I have no idea if he lived or not. Maybe I committed manslaughter that night. I'll never really know. Nobody at the restaurant believed me about this story besides one of my good friends, Jimmy. So I ended up quitting a few days later. When I got home that night and told my parents, we called the police and those people were gone. The house was vacant and I genuinely believe whoever those people were were planning on murdering me or worse. I don't want to even think of what's worse than that, but selling my organs on the black market isn't completely out of the question now, is it? I used to work at home from my job, and when I did that, I would walk to Starbucks. Every day, there was a Starbucks that I could walk to, and it would take about 20 minutes. So, I would wake up and then make the walk to Starbucks, and then head back before work. It allowed me to get my steps in and also get my morning coffee. Well, I did just this about every day for probably two or three months, until something caused me to stop. It was a regular weekday and I left my house at 7 a.m. For the daily walk to Starbucks, the walk there was fine. I would take sidewalks the entire way and back. Most of the roads were usually pretty quiet, but the two roads closest to Starbucks were a little bit busier. After I got my Starbucks, I ordered my usual coffee and then waited inside until it was done. Starbucks was somewhat busy with it being the morning and all, but as I waited, I just browsed around on my phone. Soon, my coffee was done and I took it and started to walk back now. When I was about halfway home, I was walking on the left side of the road on the sidewalk. The street was an onland residential street and there was a mixture of apartment buildings and houses. I remembered that as I was walking, this car came down the street in the same direction that I was going. It then slowed down. I expected it to pass me, but it didn't. It was a gray sedan and seemed sort of old. I'm not much of a car person though, so I don't know the exact year, make, or model. I noticed that the car was traveling at around the same speed that I was walking. I didn't know why though. None of the people that I knew had that kind of car, so it couldn't have been one of my friends or something. As the car continued to go at around the same speed as me, I felt sort of nervous. After maybe 30 seconds of this, the car actually started to pull over to the side of the road and in front of me. I wanted to get away from them. I had just passed a sidewalk that went between two apartment buildings. To my left, as the car was pulling over, I turned around and went down the sidewalk. The car would have no way of following me down there. I just hoped that whoever was driving wouldn't get out and go after me or something. When I walked a decent ways down the sidewalk between buildings, I didn't hear anybody walking behind me or anything. I stayed there for a little while and then went back. When I did, nobody was there and the car was gone. After that, I kept on going with my walk home. I made it back okay and didn't really know what to make of the whole situation. I was just glad that the car didn't continue to follow me. So, for the next few days, I continued to walk to Starbucks every morning. That one incident didn't stop me. I didn't even consider not going. However, sometime during the next week, I saw the car again. It was almost the same exact situation as before. I was walking down the same sidewalk on the same street. I saw the car again slowly drive a little past me. I thought to myself, not this again, when I saw it. I sped up and started walking quickly. The car maintained speed with me again. I looked over to see who was driving, but couldn't tell from my angle. Coming up ahead was the same sidewalk between buildings that I had gone down before. When I got there, I went down the same sidewalk again as I did before. I walked almost all the way down and then went back hoping to see that the car was gone again like before. When I got to the corner and looked around, though, the car was still there. It was parked on the side of the road. I didn't see anybody around it on the sidewalk, though, 
Still, I didn't want to take any chances, so I walked back down the sidewalk between the buildings from there. I took another way home. It took a while longer, but I didn't see that car again for the rest of the day now. After that, I really should have stopped walking to Starbucks every morning, but I didn't. I kept going, and the very next day I walked to Starbucks without a problem on the way back. I was very careful to watch out for the car. In fact, I took a separate way home from the road I had seen it on before. Eventually, I was able to make it back to my street and to my house. When I got inside my house, literally seconds after I closed the door, I saw the car. It was driving down my usual quiet street. It was traveling at a very low speed. The car did not stop at my house though, but kept going. When it went out of sight, I kept watching out the window. About a minute later, it came back, but once more, it kept going past my house. I was careful so that whoever was driving wouldn't see me through the window. After that, I finally stopped walking to Starbucks. Luckily, I haven't seen the car since. I have a few theories of who it was, but I don't know exactly. I think it might have been someone who saw me at Starbucks maybe multiple times. It also could have been a random person. They must have somehow followed me to my street. But I don't believe they know which house was mine. I feel lucky that nothing bad happened. So this happened about a year ago. I like to dog sit for my coworkers in the hospital for extra cash. One of the nurses wanted me to dog sit for her while her and her family went out of town. I had done this many times, so I had no problem being alone with the dog. She lived in a very nice area of town, so bad things weren't likely to happen, or at least I thought. She told me that her husband was a police officer for the city that they lived in, but his guns would be locked away. She also went on to tell me that they have a security system that will record anything and everything by all of the doors. She gave me the lock information if it was needed, but I insisted that I would be fine. Fast forward to me dog sitting. The first couple nights were fairly normal. It was a big house, so it was a little creepy, but nothing I haven't dealt with before. One night, me and my boyfriend at the time were watching TV in the living room. The blinds were open to the backyard. It was most likely around midnight since me and him both worked night schedules and we saw a light flash through the yard. But it wasn't a car passing by because it angled down to the grass. The dog was in the kennel since he was a pup and needed to be in for sleep so the dog wouldn't have been able to go and find someone. Well, we both noticed it, so we decided to go outside and check it out, but no one was there. Absolutely nothing or no one. So naturally, we went to bed because now it was getting to be late. While laying in the bedroom upstairs talking, we heard a door shut from downstairs. I immediately shushed my boyfriend at the time and said, Did you hear that? And he said, Yeah, but I don't know what it was. He then gets up to lock the bedroom door and turn off the lights. And then he whispers to me, he says, Be quiet and listen. We sat in the dark room shaking and we heard yet another door shut downstairs. He tells me, Call the cops. As he grabbed a lamp at the bedside and stands by the door. As I was on the phone with the operator, she tries to call me down, telling me that officers were on their way to the scene. Then we heard footsteps of our invader coming upstairs to where we were at. I started to cry quietly, telling the lady on the phone that the person was upstairs with us now. At this point, we heard a knock at the door and footsteps going back down the stairs. I was crying and telling the lady that there was a knock on the door. She reassured me that it was the cops, but I had to come downstairs to let them in. I told her, You're insane. A person is in this house and you want me to go downstairs. She tells me that it is protocol to let them in to search, though. So, me and my boyfriend ran down the stairs as fast as we could to open the door, lamps still in hand. We opened the door for the cops and told them that there is someone here and what we heard. They walk into the house telling us to wait outside while they investigate. One officer goes straight outside to the back as he yells out into the dark. If anyone is out here, make yourself known. Me and my boyfriend heard rustling through the bushes near us. The officers didn't find anyone in the home, but we know there was. We knew what we heard. Fast forward to a couple months later, we were watching a movie about an invasion. I believe it was Open House on Netflix. And we got to talking about our experience again together. 
Come to find that the same day of the invasion, I believe I met the intruder. I remembered I was outside around morning time, getting ready to get in my car, when a young man walking by asked me if the car in their driveway was for sale. I said, I'm not sure. I'm only dog-sitting for them, but they should be back in a few days. He thanks me kindly for telling me and walks off. I looked at the car next to mine in the driveway, and it didn't have a for sale sign anywhere. I had no idea at the time what I had done, but I know that the man walking by was our invader. I'm still afraid to dog sit again. I remember one of the most traumatizing moments of my life, like it was yesterday. It all started on a normal Saturday. I worked as a pizza delivery driver for just shy of two years, but I quit the very same night all of this happened. As a teenager, my friends and I used to be those neighborhood degenerate kids that every neighbor would hate to have. I'm only barely being harsh on myself because it's the truth. Sometimes we would ding dong ditch the houses a few streets over, and sometimes we would do the same house more than once on the same nights, just to see if we could get a better reaction. Well, there was a man named Mr. Johnson. He knew most of us kids and wasn't very fond of us. He knew what we were up to in the neighborhood, I think. Probably the same degeneracy he was up to as a young boy as well. I'm sure he thought we were the ones knocking on his door all those nights, but he really didn't have the proof, so things were always forced to stay civil between us. I always wondered if he had a hunch. We messed with him multiple weekends that summer and never got caught. Well, fast forward to September of the same year, I was working my usual night shift delivering pizzas. When I got an order for a simple cheese pizza, I noticed that it was the same street as my parents, in the same neighborhood. But what I had no clue was that the order was for Mr. Johnson's house. It wasn't until that I was halfway down the street that I realized who the order was for. The name was under Mark, which had to be Mr. Johnson's first name, I assumed. I swallowed my pride and hoped he wouldn't recognize me. I knocked on the door and waited, with every second feeling like the time was standing still. When finally, the door swung open. In an instant, Mr. Johnson was towering over me and I got a huge whiff of what his house smelled like. There was a very off-putting smell coming from that house. It smelled like garbage. Hello, he said with a creepy smile rubbing off his face. I took a step closer and he hunched over to whisper something in my ear. I could now smell his breath, which smelled like rotten eggs and stale cigarettes. If you ever come back here, I will kill you, he said. And the same thing goes for your stupid little friends. And then he patted me on the back and gave me a $50 bill, which covered the pizza and added a generous tip. I didn't say anything. Our eyes locked together and I think he got the hint that I understood him loud and clear. After I got in my car, Mr. Johnson was standing right where I saw him last and he was staring me down. I bolted out of there, but not before noticing him lifting his shirt up, which revealed a gun tucked in his pants. He then pointed at me with his hand in the shape of a fake gun and pretended to shoot me and started laughing. I was too nervous to tell my friends about what happened as they would probably make fun of me for being scared. And I knew that would only make them want to mess with him more. And I was right because a few weeks later I ended up telling them. We were all hanging out when they all decided it was time to go out and egg some houses, including Mr. Johnson's. I was worried about all of our safety, so I had to tell them. I ended up getting into a huge argument with my friends, and they sort of laughed at me and called me a pussy like I thought they would, but they don't understand the seriousness of this man, and neither do any of you listening. He was a very scary man, and he was a lot bigger up close. He had some muscle on him, and he looked like a neo-Nazi, a man that doesn't fuck around, let me put it that way. I didn't want to find out, so I stayed home that night and I stayed in any other time after that. Since my friends keep messing with Mr. Johnson, I'm just worried that he's going to think I have a part in it. I don't go outside by myself very often in my own neighborhood because I'm worried I will run into him. I told my parents and they said I deserved it for being a dumbass, which might be partially true, but I don't think I deserve to die. Although I feel guilty for what I did, I like my life and would like to continue living it. Maybe I'm the asshole. I had a Costco membership last year, just for a couple of months. It seemed like a good deal, 
and at first I liked it a lot. I would shop there at least one time per week, but usually more. One day, I went there to get some groceries and everyday items. I had a lot of shopping to do that day, and Costco was not the only store that I had to go to. There was one other store that I would be going to afterwards. I spent a while shopping inside Costco, and when I was done, I was really hungry. I stopped at the cafe that they had at the front of the store. There was an area to buy food and drinks and some tables set up around it. I got some pizza and churros and went to one of the tables to eat. I did not want to eat in my car. I was at a table on the side, kind of in the corner of the cafeteria area. I was just minding my own business, eating, and looked up to see this guy staring right at me. He was sitting in front of me and there were two open tables in between us. The guy was staring at me so intense that it instantly creeped me out. He had these wide eyes and I looked down right away. When I looked up again, he was still staring. Was this guy joking around? It didn't really seem like it. I didn't know him either and couldn't think of why he would be staring at me like this. I didn't bother to try to talk to him or anything. It was really weird and I decided to just go out to my car and leave. I got up from the table and walked away. When I did, luckily, the man remained at his table sitting there. I went out to the parking lot and found my car. I got inside and finished eating my churros in there. Then I headed to my final stop of the day, one last store. This store was just five minutes away and it was pretty busy when I got there, just like Costco had been. I drove to find an open parking space towards the back and parked my car. Then I went inside and did my shopping. It didn't take as long in there, maybe about 15 minutes. I came back out and got to my car and went inside of it. When I did, across the parking lot, I saw the same guy. He was sitting inside of a car in the driver's seat and staring at me almost the same way that he had been earlier at Costco. This creeped me out even more so than before. I immediately backed out and started driving away to leave. The problem was that I kind of had to drive by his car to exit the parking lot. As I drove past him, I saw his car pull out and began driving behind me. My heart sank when I saw this. Now I was leaving the parking lot with this creep right behind me. I turned right and he did the same. Then I drove down the road for a little ways and turned again. He remained right on my tail. I didn't even care about going home anymore at that point. I just started randomly driving, turning at almost every opportunity. Soon, I didn't really even know where I was anymore. I was just going down random quiet roads. I got inside of a residential area and the guy was still following me. It became clear to me that this guy would follow me wherever I went. I wasn't sure what to do, but that's when I finally got the idea to go to the police station. I put the closest one in on my phone and then followed the directions to get there. It took maybe 10 minutes with the guy following me the entire time. When I got there, I pulled into the parking lot and the guy didn't. He kept driving down the road. It worked just as I hoped it would. I waited there for a while before actually going home. I was afraid that the guy would be waiting around some corner or something and then keep following me, but luckily he wasn't. I was able to make it home safely and did not see him again. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago when she was in high school and I was in middle school. Our mom worked as a house cleaner and always became good friends with everyone whose homes she cleaned. One of the homes was owned by an older couple who had no kids but had a huge house and a really nice pool that they always invited me and my siblings to come swim in. The husband worked as the CEO of a large airline company and they lived in a really nice neighborhood on a large lot with a forest of trees. When you were in their backyard, you couldn't see any other houses at all, just trees. It felt really secluded and almost spa-like with a waterfall and a short iron fence so you had good views of the forest. Their house was really interesting, with multiple levels made from walls of stone, even on the inside. Pretty much every room had huge floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out, so it was always a little unnerving to walk by them since you couldn't see what was out there. The couple also decorated with old Native American art and masks, which was a little creepy to a middle schooler, but the couple wasn't creepy, so I never got too scared. They had an old golden retriever dog named Samson that lived up to his name and was massive, but had a sweet and gentle temperament. 
On the other hand, they also had recently rescued a husky mix named Sadie, who was quite the opposite. Psycho Sadie, as we lovingly called her, had intense separation and stranger anxiety. She would destroy their house when they were left inside, jump their short fence if they left her outside, and if they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car and howl non-stop until they returned. So since they were wealthy and had the extra money, they would pay for me or my sister to come over and dog sit while they went out. We got paid $20 an hour, so we were always excited to go over there and watch their cable and swim in their awesome pool. Normally, everything would be fine and both dogs would just lay around, but occasionally, Sadie would realize I was a stranger and go nuts and just start barking at me. One time, she backed me into a corner and would not stop barking, and I literally watched her eyes turn red. I was convinced she was going to attack me, but she eventually calmed down after I got up on a couch and showed her how big, not I was. But I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend while the homeowners were out of town for two days. They were paying my sister to stay there over the weekend and I stayed her with her the first night because it was a big house and kind of scary to stay there all alone. And we stayed up late watching chick flicks and eating drunk. The next day we swam in their pool and hung out but for some reason I didn't spend the night again and I'm so glad I didn't because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on their treadmill. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge sliding glass door that opened to their patio and pool. She had the TV on in their workout room, watching the Ten Commandments that is always on the night before Easter. As she was running, she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever a door was opened. She stopped the treadmill and went to look around and saw that the sliding glass door was open. Now this door is huge and there's absolutely no way it could have opened by itself, so she was instantly freaked. However, the dogs were just laying there in the workout room and she figured they would have gotten up to investigate if someone had come inside since they have those kinds of instincts and because Sadie was so schizo and hated strangers, so she was able to make the excuse that she had accidentally left the door open and that she must have imagined the beep of the alarm and it could have been the TV or the treadmill. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out, but a couple minutes later, she had the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around but didn't see anyone and finished her workout, but couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. So she decided to just go to bed because she was a little creeped out and just wanted to forget about it. It was at this point that my sister went around and made sure all the doors were locked. The owners didn't give her the alarm code, so she couldn't set it. She took a shower and locked herself in the guest room with both dogs, just in case, and eventually fell asleep. A couple of hours later, she awoke to both dogs growling at the door of the room. Now, it was fairly normal for Psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never barked or shown any signs of aggressiveness at all, so immediately, my sister knew something was up. She was shaking and trying to convince herself that the dogs had just hurt an animal and that it was nothing. But then she heard that dreadful door alarm beep. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming, and he told her to hang up and call the police while he was on his way over. She called the cops, and my dad made the 15-minute drive in under five minutes. When she opened the door to try to let my dad in the house, the dogs took off running and barking through the whole house and downstairs to the basement. My dad took a quick look around the upstairs level with his gun, but didn't see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around and found that the back gate was open as well as the sliding glass door again, but not enough to let the dogs out. Just barely like it had been slammed shut and bounced back open a little. They said it did look like someone had entered the home through the sliding glass door because the lock was tampered with, but they determined that whoever it was hadn't stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs being locked up, the police said that they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband had received a death threat because of some decision he made at his job that put a lot of people out of work. They had gone to the police about it, but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Thanks a lot for the heads up, by the way. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because he lost his job, and to me, he deserved it. I used to work at Costco. My job was mainly as a cashier up at the check lanes. I had this job for six months, and it was okay. Something really scary happened once, though, 
so I thought I would share my experience. It all started on a Friday night. I was working a shift where I got off at 8 p.m. I'm not sure when I started, but it wasn't too long of a shift. Things went by pretty easy, and I know that it was dark outside when I got off. After clocking out, I left the store to go to my car. I had parked at the back end of the parking lot, kind of in the middle. Behind our parking lot, there were some more businesses of other stores and restaurants, but they were separated by a row of trees. I was excited to go home after a long day of work, and I got within like 20 feet of my car and took out my keys. I was about to push the unlock button on my key fob when I saw something. Somebody was inside of my car. I stopped in my tracks and looked. It appeared as though there was a man sitting in the back seat of my car. He was looking in the other direction and not towards me. I double checked to make sure that this was in fact my car. I knew that it was, but why was somebody inside of it? I didn't go any further and turned around and walked back for the Costco entrance. My mind was racing. I was trying to figure out how and why somebody would be inside of my car, and I was also wondering what I should do about it now. I found a coworker inside of the store who I was friendly with and told her about what had happened. She offered to come outside with me and look to see if the person was still there. We both walked out and slowly approached my car. We stopped at about 50 feet away and looked. It looked like he was gone now. We didn't see anything. We walked closer to the car. Very carefully, we made it within probably 10 feet. That's when we could see the guy was still there and ducking down in the back. Luckily, he did not see us. We walked back a ways, and my coworker told me to hit the unlock button to my car to see if the guy would leave. I did, and we waited, kind of hiding behind another car. The guy did not leave my vehicle, though. We could no longer see him because he was ducked down still, but we would be able to tell if he left my car. He stayed inside. After waiting for like 30 seconds to a minute, we both headed back inside of Costco. We were thinking about calling the police. After talking for several minutes inside and talking to another coworker about it, I decided that I would. I walked back outside to call the police and stood near the entrance doors of Costco as I began dialing. But it was at this point that I saw the guy actually get out of my car. He left out the rear passenger side door, which was the farthest away from me. Then I saw him slip away behind the trees leading to some other businesses nearby. I carefully walked back to my car. I kept my eyes on the trees the entire time. The guy was now out of my sight, and who knows where, but if he came back, I would see him. I was able to get inside of my car and lock the doors. Then, finally, I drove back to my house. When I got home, I looked throughout my car. Everything seemed the same. I never really kept anything of value inside of it. In fact, I didn't really have anything in it at all. So nothing was stolen, and nothing was damaged either. I don't know what the guy was doing in there, but it really gives me the creeps. Did he know that it was specifically my car, or was this a random thing? I don't know. I figured that I must have forgotten to lock my car doors though. Usually I always remember to lock them, but it must have slipped my mind. I don't know how else to explain him being able to get inside of my car. I'm just glad that he left though. He must have realized that I knew he was in my car when I unlocked it, but never got inside.